Hi, and welcome to Global Studies with Ms. Pritchard. This video is for Global 2 students. It covers democratic reforms of the 19th century, and it's about Britain expanding its democracy. It goes along with Chapter 26. All right, the traditional government in Britain. Remember, we already learned about the English Civil War, which is when Cromwell and Parliament were fighting against Charles I, and it, he ends up losing his head. You all remember that part of it. Anyways, Britain becomes a constitutional monarchy when Charles II takes the throne in 1662. Now, wealthy landowners still controlled Parliament. The increase in education during industrialization forces a change in the government. The working class women and colonists all want a voice in government. So while you're having industrialization, you also get the American Revolution. Then you get the working class and the women fighting for the right to vote. So you're going to see why Britain decides, yeah, well, maybe we should suck it up and let everybody have a vote. All right, the Enlightenment, Industrialization, and Political Revolutions that occur in the 18th century encourage a peaceful political reform in Britain. At the start, only 5% of the population had a voice in government. Now, the British landowners fear a rebellion, so they decide to share the power. And remember, they had watched the French Revolution, where it was a very similar circumstance, where 3% of the population was controlling everything. And remember, a lot of that 3% got its head chopped off. So the British didn't want that to happen. So they say, okay, yeah, I guess you guys can vote. The reforms start with the Reform Bill of 1832, which gives middle-class men the right to vote, and it gives urban areas representation in Parliament, because up to that point, it was only landowners that were represented and districts. And the cities had no districts because they didn't really have landowners. You do get a reform group known as the Chartists, and they want secret ballots, no land requirement to serve in Parliament, and salaries for members of Parliament. They want secret ballots so that nobody can harass you about who you voted for and sway any elections. No land requirement opens it up for everybody to be able to serve, even the middle class that lives in the city. And salaries for members of Parliament also makes it equitable for everybody to serve in Parliament, because if you're being paid for it, you can do it. If you're not being paid, you have to be rich to be able to do that, because otherwise your family will starve. Now, you also get women begin to fight for the right to vote during the 1800s, and there are a lot of connections between the women in the British Empire and the women in America all fighting for the right to vote. All right, France. The Third Republic emerges after the Franco-Prussian War. And one of the big things in France is the Dreyfus Affair. A Jewish officer is framed and convicted of treason. And when it comes out that he was framed simply because he was Jewish, that reveals how anti-Semitic Europe has become. And anti-Semitism means discrimination and hatred of Jews. Um, so in response to that, you get Zionism. The Jews decide they want a return to their homeland of Palestine. Remember, the Romans had kicked them out in 76 AD. So now, 1800 years later, they want to go back. That's going to be a problem. And just a little clue here, it's still a problem today. All right, the British colonies. Canada, New Zealand, and Australia all get made into dominions. In other words, they get home rule. They control all of their domestic affairs, but they are still linked to Britain in terms of trade and foreign policy. And this is because culturally, they're very similar to the British. What you can read in there is that they look like the British, they act like the British, they talk like the British. They seem very British. Ireland, South Africa, and India also have movements for home rule, but the British refuse to give them independence. And this is based on ethnocentrism and out-and-out -out racism. In terms of Ireland, it's a lot of ethnocentrism because the Irish are Catholic and the British are not. 
in South Africa and India, it's blatant racism where they think that the people with darker skin are simply inferior to them. All right, in Ireland, the British imposed their culture and attempt to destroy the Irish culture. They banned schools and the Celtic language. Interesting fact, you can get into university in Ireland today by speaking your native language, in other words, speaking the Celtic language, and you get credit for a foreign language. In Ireland, the native language is now considered a foreign language because so few people speak it. All right, and you get the Catholic versus the Protestant. Northern Ireland gets a large Protestant population. It's a lot of Scots that move to Ireland because the land is cheap. Um, then you have the potato famine in 1848, which pushes many, many Irish out. So there are actually more Irish in the United States than in Ireland. In 1916, this is right in the middle of World War I, there is an uprising. And this really, really makes the British angry because they're like, hey, we're already fighting a war here and now you guys are going to do this. And this is when you get the IRA. They are developed to fight for home rule and they are still considered a terrorist group by the U.S. government. In 1921, they are granted independence, but Northern Ireland remains a part of Britain, and it is a part of Britain today, and that is because, as I said, they have a Protestant majority, or at least they did in 1921. I believe with the last census, that has changed, but it's going to take a huge vote and many, many years for them to become part of Ireland. All right, and the conflict in Northern Ireland redevelops during the 1970s. A huge part of that is because your Catholic population is growing more and it's becoming more balanced, so you don't quite have the Protestants controlling everything anymore because the Catholics want an equal voice. All right, the 19th century also sees a technology explosion. Edison and Vault invents the light bulb, the phonograph, and motion pictures. Um, he also invented many, many other things. He had a huge studio in New Jersey where he invented things. And, well, you go to a school that's named after him. So that should tell you right there he was into technology. You also get Eastman, Kodak film, motion picture film. And they dominated in photography and motion picture film for most of the 20th century. Now Kodak no longer produces film, and, well, they've just come out of bankruptcy. But they're still a local, and they were one of our major employers for many, many years, and you can still see Eastman's hand all over Rochester. There's a school of music. There's a school of dentistry. We have the Eastman House. We have the top film archive in the world right here in Rochester. So all of that is pretty cool. Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone. Marconi invents the radio. Henry Ford, he does not invent the car, but he invents a better way to build the car. The Wright brothers take their first flight. In fact, they took it on the Outer Banks at Kitty Hawk, but they were from Ohio. And one invention leads to another, and then the rate just keeps increasing. So we're back to that whole domino metaphor that we've used many times in global studies this year. So think of technology like that. Medicine. We also discover a lot of things about medicine in this time period. Um, the germ theory is developed by Louis Pasteur, and he discovers that bacteria causes disease. You might note the picture of milk there. That is because most of the drinks that you guys buy are pasteurized. That means they're heated up to a temperature that kills a majority of the bacteria and then they're cooled back down. That's because Louis Pasteur discovered that bacteria causes disease. Then we also get Joseph Lister who links bacteria to post-surgery deaths and this is when surgeons begin sterilizing their equipment. Yes, Think about that for just a minute. It is just over a century that they decided, hmm, I cut that guy's leg off. Maybe I should rinse off the knife before I go to the next guy. All right, and you also get vaccines developed to fight disease. 
All right, in terms of science, Darwin proposes the theory of evolution, which is still incredibly controversial today. In fact, there are some districts where you can't even mention that evolution exists. Mendel, um, he is the one who studies genetics, and he is the one who came up with that cool little square that shows how traits are passed off to the offspring. So if one parent has blue eyes and one parent has brown eyes, what's the likelihood of their kids having blue or brown eyes? Um, and I can tell you, once you get three grandparents with blue eyes and only one with brown eyes, all bets are off. Because, well, if you ask me, I can explain that just within my own family. All right, Dalton discovers that all matter is made of atoms. Mendeleev creates the periodic table of elements. The Curies discover radioactivity, and a little note here, I believe they also both died of cancer because they were exposed to radioactivity. Rutherford discovers that atoms have a nucleus surrounded by electrons and that that is what determines a lot of the reactions of the chemicals to each other, or I should say the elements to each other. All right, social sciences also take a huge leap forward. Archaeology, anthropology, and psychology all develop in the late 19th century. Scientists want to explain human behavior and development you get Freud, who discovers we have a conscious and unconscious mind and that both influence our behavior. Pavlov studies animals, and then he theorizes that you can do that. You know, you can take what he's learned about animals and transfer it to people, too. I will show you a cool video about that next week. Um, and basically, Pavlov develops that you can be trained for an automatic response. But as I said, there's a video for that next week. All right, mass culture. This is what we call popular culture today. Think MTV and YouTube and all of the social media, the way that you get information and what's cool and what's not, that is popular culture. The increase in education leads to a larger market for art, music, and literature. The labor reforms lead to more leisure time, which also increases the market for the arts. Remember during the urban game, we talked about how people were working like 15-hour days? Once you get labor reforms, it's eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep, and eight hours for whatever we want to do. And that's how they broke down the 24-hour day. You also get spectator sports. And music, vaudeville, and movies also spread cultural ideas. And if you think about it, music and movies and videos is how we get a lot of our popular culture today. All right, so that is it for the democratic reforms and changes of the 19th century. Make sure you show me your notes for credit.